Hey, Mr. Parker here to do another director spotlight, and the director I've chosen to do is Missouri's own Eric Stanzi. It's funny that I've uh, been, uh, most of these indie directors are coming from, you know, not. Like, people think directors come from L.A. or live in New York, L.A. These directors have been coming from Ohio, Florida, they reside in Kentucky or Missouri, things like that. And, uh, you know, I enjoy that, and I've chosen to do Eric Stanzi. And uh, the Wicked Pixel Group, I will be focusing on the films that Eric Stanzi directed. He's directed nine feature films. Uh, he's produced tons more. He's done shorts. He's done editing. He's done second unit directing. He's a jack of all trades. He's pretty much done every little bit of thing you could do in a movie. Adding, acting, editing, directing, producing, everything. But uh, let me hop into, and the first movie he did uh, about 20 years ago, 20 some years ago, is The Scare Game, which starred his, uh, which would become a regular uh, DJ Viona. Uh, I hope I'm saying his name right, but he's pretty much in almost half, at least half of his movies, if not more. And uh, the most interesting thing about this is it's a precursor to his later film, Ice from the Sun. The Scare Game is a shot on video. It's really low budget. It's kind of an awkward movie with a kind of a cool concept. It's basically a supernatural entity wants these people to partake in this game of death, and they're stuck in there. And it's a really odd, uh, created world, and it's very weird. And uh, the killer in here, you know, DJ Vionis, I've heard him explain as like a terminal with a mullet, but I kind of see more of like a mix of Freddy and Pinhead, which really doesn't mix well and makes it kind of like an awkward performance. And later on, he would do good jobs, but I just thought that the entire movie was kind of lackluster. Uh, there is a there's a good concept in here, but it's just and there's good gore and some good camera shots and things like that. But the Scare Game was definitely his weakest film, as I you know it's kind of a a lot of times your first film can be your weakest, but uh, it's always best to be getting better instead of digressing, and uh, the Eric Stanty and the Wicked Pixel group seems to be progressing greatly. I'd say they progress better than any of the other directors I have covered thus far, for sure. Uh, that is the Scare Game, which uh, there is another edition out here that is with the fine art. They're both trimmed down and made into an anthology tape from Tempe. Uh, good luck finding that. I've never had luck. I didn't even have luck uh, 10, 12 years ago when I bought this, 13 years ago. And I watched it then, and I had to revisit it, and I hadn't seen it in years. Get the hell away from me! Just one dance! That's all I ask! One dance with me! Just go away, please! Just go away! Why won't you dance with me? You broke my flesh! But uh, his next film was uh, The Fine Art, which uh, was the appearance of his longtime producer who starred in this one, uh, and uh, another regular, Lisa Morrison and Jeremy Wallace. But uh, this film was a, it's just a little tiny step above The Scare Game, but it's, it's a much more straightforward film. It's called The Fine Art. Basically, it's about these two loners who end up uh, getting together, and one finds a dark secret about each other, and... Uh, you know, they start to one starts to suspect the other one of doing some serial murders. Uh, the best part about the movie is the cool paintings on here, and this is what the killer does. They, they paint the paintings of their victims, and that's how they find out that this is the killer. Uh, it's kind of like part love story, part cat and mouse thing, but uh, it's very straightforward for him, and a little different than a lot of his other typical films. It is a, it's a tiny step above uh, the scare game, but not much. Uh, I would say that those two are really only worth checking out if you were a huge enthusiast of Eric Stanzi and Wicked Pixels films. Their next movie, which I think is the first time that they struck gold, was, uh, and they would strike gold many more times, is the film Savage Harvest. And uh, on the commentaries and things like that, it seems that Eric Stanzi doesn't, uh, didn't really care for this movie at first, but he grew to, grown to like it. This is actually the first edition with the better cover art uh, here. I hope you can see that with the melting uh, face. I can't remember the monster's name. And this is the second one from Image. It's funny, I bought this one used because I had this one and I wanted to check out the other commentary. And someone actually sold this. With Eric Stanzi, I don't know if it's his real signature, 
But uh, it's kind of weird. They had it uh, made out to them, whatever. But I think that's kind of uh, weird to get somebody to sign a movie and then sell it with signed to you, which is kind of odd. Maybe the guy died or something. I don't know. But anyways, uh, Savage Harvest is, you know, it's your kind of your plot. These teens go out and uh, they run into some demons in the woods. You think Evil Dead, you think Night of the Demons. But this movie, as uh, simple as it is, is not as simply uh, played out. I mean, there's so many other little detailed things in there that make it such a better movie. I mean, uh, the idea with the rocks, the idea is that they're on an ancient Indian place where all these rocks that are cursed are there and each one resembles a different demon and if the, the main shaman's bloodline is on there and somebody touches the rocks, they will become this certain demon all based on animals. So basically what you get is a bunch of different kinds of demons uh, resembling animals. It's, it's gory, it's fun, it's actually kind of scary and it's the first time they all started coming together I think and they made it a really, really entertaining wildly cool movie with a a lot of concepts that were not, an, I don't want to say, a little different concepts in a movie that could have just been cookie cutter and it made it very entertaining. Uh, there's a lot of regular faces in here. Uh, Bill Clifton's first time, Lisa Morris and DJ Viona, and uh, Tony Bridges does special effects. He did for a few of their movies, but I really love Savage Harvest. Uh, one of them is like a snake, and he has the, or is a spider, and he has the tongue, and the, the special effects are really cool. One's the vulture demon. So you get all these different demons in here, and there's just a lot of really uh, creativity in here and camera angles that are different including uh, the barrier scene, which is really cool as well. But I would highly recommend Savage Harvest for demon fans and horror movie fans. It is one of the best demon movies I've ever seen. I, I'm a big fan of demon movies. Demons, Night of the Demons, Demon Knight, Demon Wind, hell, even Demon Warp, right? But uh, I don't think Demon Warp qualifies as a demon movie. But Savage Harvest is a really awesome, fun movie. And that's really what it is, but it's, it's, it's better than just a fun movie. It actually has a lot of thought and heart and dedication put into it. You can tell. It's on the screen. And some of the special effects are really uh, awesome. Like uh, there's a scene with a head, uh, with his head smashed in and stuff like that. And the demons are all really unique and that always makes it better. Different demon monsters and things like that. And it also sets up a play of who touched the rocks, who didn't touch the rocks. It creates suspense in its film. And that's always a plus. To kill them, you've got to get them in the heart. Destroy the heart, make it stop beating. There's also something here about the medicine man of the tribe. His last words before he died became something of a common phrase, like a motto or something to the remaining tribe. Uh, the translation of his dying words reads, Forever beware his deceiving nature. Petals of the rose can be masks that hide an evil soul. Obviously this was in reference to an elder, a trusted religious leader turned bad. I guess I felt pretty betrayed. Check this out, Gary made sketches of all the symbols that were on the rocks. There's a spider, a scorpion, a bobcat, a boar, a snake, a wolf, a vulture. Here's the creepiest one, the demon of man. Gary wrote a lot about this one. If someone touches a rock with the man-demon symbol on it, they're possessed by the most dangerous demon of all. Someone possessed by the man-demon won't attack and kill like an animal. It thinks. And the next movie uh, was actually their craziest, and I think probably their biggest call to fame, obviously, for a long time, was... Uh, Ice from the Sun. It might be Scrapbook, but Ice from the Sun, which is a really weird movie. Uh, it breaks a whole bunch of different rules. And the first time they showed uh, graphic nudity, and as you would come to find out, the Wicked Pixel group is not, they will show male, female nudity. They don't have boundaries. And their films don't have boundaries. Either their plots or their the nudity or anything like that. If they want to do something, they do it right, and they do it uh, in, not in your face for the sake of doing it in your face. It just is done. It's done. It's there. Which I really, uh, really approve of. I love that. I mean, just do it. Just it's part of the film. Make the film. Don't, don't beat around the bush or try to hide things you shouldn't. But uh, Ice from the Sun is really. I, I want to compare it to Hellraiser two, but it, it's similar, but nothing like it at the same time. It, it, it just wrap your head around the plot. Uh, it basically follows a woman who just committed suicide. And uh, she's basically told uh, by some sort of guardian or something like that that you have a choice. You can either go where you're going to go 
which might be hell, or you can infiltrate this secret uh, world that we can't get into, angels or demons, and stop this guy who's running this place because he's taking some of our souls and we want them back. And basically it's a kind of a, a continuation of the scare game, but a hundred times better, that uh, DJ Viona Marie comes back and he does a great job in this one. And they're basically taking people's souls, they're having the game of survival, and the strongest person who faces their fears and overcomes the demon in the game will then for take over the game but uh it kind of gets messed up here when they send in somebody who doesn't belong in the game and she's a hardcore tough chick which is a reoccurring theme in his films there's a lot of uh it doesn't matter if you're male or female you don't really fall into your character types there's a lot of tough uh female characters in the movies which is cool as well it's kind of annoying to see everyone fall down and break a nail and fall down the stairs and things like that or uh you know fit into a certain mold they try to break molds and you know like that and i appreciate that uh and uh, this release here is a great release. They have a making of, which has its own commentary, which is interesting as well. But this movie, I guess I would call it transgressive in the fact that it just breaks tons and tons of boundaries without any... It just does what it wants, and it's crazy. It creates its own world to do whatever it wants. Instead of just making a bunch of nonsensical crap and not explaining it at all, they explain it a little bit and have a bunch of crazy stuff like that so you can understand why it's happening and all these people are facing their fears. And uh, people, I, in the commentaries, I noticed they said that it was a lot like Seth kind of seemed like it stole from it or it's a coincidence i have not watched cell but i would highly recommend ice from the sun as a super i think it's super eight millimeter and it just it looks awesome to me i love the visual look of it and uh the music in here as well all the music in his films is kind of uh counter what people would think they think uh, oh it's an indie horror movie they're gonna have uh you know sometimes they have good music but a lot of times those but they're just gonna have head banging heavy metal death metal crap that doesn't fit the movie and serves no purpose except to suck in metalhead fans to watch the horror movie as well which i dislike strongly and uh they actually choose very good soundtracks in here and music and they use appropriate music or unappropriate music that really fits the movie and i enjoy that uh, i think the soundtracks are well uh, well picked and uh, the scores are done very well but I would really recommend this movie it is gory it is mean the kills are brutal uh, the characters are different and they're just like these low lights thrown into a game I want to call them all low lights because they don't deserve this but you know they're just done it's cruel it's cruel as death you can think of and there's a lot of good gore and a lot of crazy scenes that I think a lot of people enjoy. But Ice from the Sun is uh, probably an underground masterpiece. In my opinion, it's a masterpiece. You know, people would argue with you. But uh, they went from Savage Heart. They went from two shot on video movies that were just, eh, eh, take them or leave them, to the amazingly fun Savage Harvest, to the masterpiece Ice from the Sun. And their next film... What are you? How are you doing this? What? Keeping me out. I was not selected to be here. You can't touch me because you didn't bring the- You're a weak, pathetic little pest. You're a mortal human being. You're feeble. You did not enter the ice on your own. Something sent you here would actually take it a next step further. I'm sure a lot of people have heard about this because I've reviewed this before. That's not why they heard about it. They've heard about it for millions better reasons than that because I'm sure like 200 people saw that review if I was lucky. But uh, Scrapbook by Eric Stanzi and this movie is, uh, you know, it was way ahead of its time. You think about it, 99. That actually is even before stuff like August Underground, which is a great film. And August Underground gets a lot of credit, as it deserves. But uh, Scrapbook should get more credit, considering the fact that this whole hardcore serial killer wave of disturb depravity and stuff like that. And a lot of times, they just kind of rip Scrapbook off and don't give it credit where credit is due. Or just are actually pieces of crap. And Scrapbook is actually a really well-crafted, well-made film. It's not enjoyable to watch. It's not something you come back and watch every Saturday night and have a couple beers to. It's definitely not that movie. It's a movie that you watch a couple times and you just uh, watch the performances and think, man, these actors are dedicated. This film crew is dedicated. This is really well-made and it's a look into a serial killer and what is wrong with them. Full frontal nudity, rape, all sorts of disturbing things. Cruelty to this poor woman, Emily Hack, who is their first appearance and turns in a great performance. And uh, it's a really well-made made movie and it's really disturbing horror movie about a serial killer that's completely serious uh a lot of the crazy camera angles that you'll see in like ice from the sun like fall on the shovel and savage harvest and stuff like that and the neon the negative colors you won't see in this you'll see kind of just like a character study and the survival of someone and uh the killer documenting all of it in a scrapbook uh really well made 
and I have a funny story about this. I'm not sure if I explained it in the review. I first uh, got this VHS tape when I was about 13 years old or 14, and I popped it in my VCR, and the opening scene just scared the crap out of me, and the pitch black woman, and the lights come on, and her guts are hanging out. Freaked me out, and the tape didn't work. It broke down, and I then I thought, I kept trying to watch it, kept watching, showed me like 10 seconds and break down, and I thought for a while, I was like, you know, that was probably a blessing in disguise that I didn't see that at that point. I saw it a few years later because... <laughs> the first 30 seconds of a movie freaks you out that bad then the other hour and 29 and 30 seconds probably do a little more damage what the fuck is this what do you mean by this do you know who the fuck i am do you do you know who the fuck i am you're putting stupid you're fucking up the book putting your stupid bullshit in Now I need you to need me. I want to return the gift. Let me comfort the man as he has comforted the woman. I strap you down and taste you, bind you so that you are submerged in my what for you? Clara's man. Captive because he wants to feel free and in his woman's lust? Experience me? Let me love you? What the fuck? Wait, wait, listen. Look what you've done for me. Don't you understand? Don't you understand what you've taught me? Don't you understand that I'm the best thing that you could ever find in your book because I'm different. I'm the one you've taught to give to you so you don't have to take. How would you know what to give me? You don't fucking know me. But you want the world to see you through, through your book, right? But they have to see you through my eyes because I know you. But uh, that was, um, as they're climbing up the steps and making different films, I think they're progressing on a, a, a stair here. And uh, then they kind of uh, struck a deal with uh, Sub Rosa Films due to trying to make more movies and getting exposure and making money and things like that. And uh, they signed a deal with these Sub Rosa Extremes. There was a bunch of other movies besides the two there. Stancy directed, he produced and acted in some of them. Christmas Season Massacre, Buzz Saw, Absolution, I believe Last House on Hell Street. Just tons of titles in there. Insaniac. <laughs> I don't have them here, Undertow. But I have them all on their way. I was interested in seeing them afterwards. Of course, I have a couple around here and whatnot, but uh, bizarre. But uh, I'll just put a bunch of pictures up here, and I'll probably show them in my next update. If you guys are interested, I'll probably watch a couple of them. But I chose not to include them in this because I'm focusing on just the director. And you can't really focus on the director completely without including the crew because that makes a big part of the director, his cast, his crew. But uh, I'm not going to focus on the ones he didn't direct. And then we have uh, his next movie, I Spit on Your Corpse, I Piss on Your Grave. And these movies were supposed to be like exploitation cash-ins, obviously. This is one of I Spit on Your Grave, just title alone. But uh, I'm going to talk about the director's cut first, which uh, I never saw. I saw the director's cut first. So I mind you, this movie had terrible reaction. People were like, this sucks. It's the worst movie I've ever seen. Why is that girl naked? And I, I, why do people complain about people being naked in film, okay, you don't find that person attractive. I mean, other people probably find that person attractive. And, it's, mm, like, everyone acts like there's some beauty queen or something or some, like, model, underwear model. It's like, okay, whatever. Yeah, sure you are. But, uh, uh, I Spit on Your Corpse, I Piss in Your Grave stars Emily Hack again as well. And uh, this time the revol the re uh, the reverse the roles are reversed for her. Instead of being a victim the whole movie, she's not a victim the whole movie. But it's not your typical I want revenge. These people did me wrong. It's like kind of like it falls into her lap to get revenge. And I think that it's more believable that way because some people don't seek out things, but when things fall into people, they sometimes do it. What happens here is uh, she's been. Uh, her boyfriend gets out of jail, kidnaps her, and plans on killing her and a bunch of other people that they mutually hate in a basement. Uh, she can see up her hand, and she decides to finish the job herself. And what follows is some nasty torture, some, you know, degradation and things like that in exploitation fashion. Uh, the director's cut has more sex, has more backstory, makes a lot more sense, more polished, different soundtrack, a lot better film, than in fact. Uh, but Emily Hack does a fun job. She seems like she's having fun. There's some nasty stuff in here that I realized they said was from French investors who pushed them to put it in there. And uh, they admit that it probably made it a better film. But uh, there's some good things in here that I enjoyed. Uh, there's always, I, I like revenge films. I'm sorry. It's just like this mm, animalistic thing where it's like I like to see people get their just desserts, even if they don't even deserve them half the time. I just like, you know, 
I, I guess I'm not really a revengeful person, so watching it on film, I enjoy. But uh, Emily Hack, like I said, it's not as serious or as heavy as uh, Scrapbook. You could watch this one multiple times and be you're not going to have nightmares. But I would compare, you know, if Cannibal Holocaust is the Mac Daddy masterpiece disturbing film, then this would be like a Cannibal Ferox. Yeah, there's some disturbing stuff in there. There may be a couple animals slain for real, but there's this cheesy, campy feel to it that makes it a little more... It makes it an easier pill to swallow than something like a scrapbook. But ah, this says all these movies have commentary on him. He always does great commentaries. And the funny thing is, like at first, I I was like, ah, oh, he does the radio personality in Savage Harvest. He's got like this monotone, almost perfect uh, radio voice. But as time progressed, you like here it got used to him talking on the commentaries, and I I've come to like his voice. I thought it was very, uh, you know, that that that's a good voice. He's got a very. Uh, Good. I mean, his voice is a good voice, especially for commentaries, I'd say. It, it, he's very easy to understand. But this one uh, I would recommend as well. And in fact, uh, I would say definitely see Savage Harvest, definitely see Ice from the Sun, definitely see Scrapbook, and you could take it or leave it. Not everyone's going to like this one. I enjoyed it personally. I thought it was fun. I thought it was cool to see Emily Hack kind of reverse the roles and, you know, see, some, see her get revenge on some people instead of being the crap kicked out of the whole movie and... Then there's also this if you want to see the original cut, which I don't really recommend the original cut. This also, if you guys just want to pick up China White Serpentine, is out well on here. You guys can see uh, some other ones on there. This is a five pack from Sub Rosa. And then next is a China White Serpentine, which is a really weird movie. And you know, kind of doing these exploitation movies, it was kind of like a step back from his progression. But uh, then again, he explained that they needed money and to get more films out. And this also opened the doors for tons of his other people to work with and meeting other people. And that seemed to help uh, in his later features. But China White Serpentine is actually a pretty cool movie. It follows kind of, it's, it's a typical story, but told in a very untypical way. And I feel that the script uh, is pretty good in this one. It's a co-directed uh, because uh, they both didn't have much time. they both directors. Uh, I believe it's Robin Garens, Garrels, and she does a good job as well. And uh, this one, again, uh, has DJ Viona, and he's like this uh, alcoholic uh, writer uh, who's kind of struggling, uh, and he's struggling with his brother's death, and uh, DVD's delivered to him, and it unfolds what happened to his brother. He was in some sort of crazy drug lair, with, and he fell in love with a woman, and the woman who was they're having this weird menage a trois, and things went wrong, and someone had some secret powers, and things start to get trippy towards the end, and really different. Really good uh, memorizing, and uh, I guess you'd say uh, industrial type soundtrack in here, and some you know, no holds bars, uh, sex scenes, things like that. Lots of nudity, lots of drug use, lots of cool music, and uh, a story that unfolds to hide the twist for longer than you might think it could be possible. But uh, this one's actually really fun, a uh, really cool movie, and uh, I enjoyed it as well. I uh, also noticed there's a lot of, uh, I think they try to include a lot of uh, gay couples or gay characters in here and try to, like, change them around, which later on in one of the commentaries, Jason Christ, uh, who's been in, who first hopped on in Ice from the Sun and later directed some of their movies like Savage Harvest 2 and always starred in uh, a couple of them and had roles in them. Uh, he mentioned that uh, in uh, Ratline, the commentary that uh, a lot of movies, I, I have to mention this because I laughed out a lot, a lot of movies try to always make the, the gay characters like towards straight audience say, you don't know what this is, you don't know what this is, and that, that, that is very annoying when movies do that, like, you're not used to this, you're not, it's almost like they purposely try to make people uncomfortable and show unrealistic crappy characters, and that is very annoying, and his movies do not really do that, I think that they do, uh, you know, they paint characters that are fairly realistic instead of white black, and uh, China White Serpentine, you know, it's a pretty different movie, and you can tell it was rushed, but it still came out damn good. And then his next movie, which I think may be his personal best movie, is a movie called Deadwood Park. And uh, you guys got to see this movie. Anyone, I think, would find something in this movie that they enjoy. And uh, Deadwood Park is a really complex, uh, I guess I want to, for better terms, I, I heard other people use the term, epic story about, uh, it's an epic slow burn, if you can believe that. But uh, it basically follows a guy who's running from his present and back right into his past, and he ends up in this small town where his uh, twin brother died when he was eight years old, and finds out that this town is completely ruined from a series of child murders, and uh, I don't want to give too much away, but the film's town is a character in its own, and the way it's shot and all the locations are just so beautiful and haunting and scary and freaky and there's involved dead children and kind of a haunting thing and i'm not a big fan of haunting movies but this one's really well made and different and uh it's more uh 
also contemplating the past. And I love that it goes back into the past and things like that and really makes this whole town a character and things like that. It's a mystery. It's scary. It's sad. It's depressing. In the very end, you won't see coming. It gets pretty big. It gets big movie at the end. And the gore effects are really amazing in this one as well. And Bill Clifton comes back and he does a really good job as a lead in this. I thought so. I thought he was the most powerful actor in the film by far. Uh, but I just thought it had great locations, a great fall feeling, which he usually tries to incorporate fall, at least the scene of fall, Dead Leaves. I mean, that's like horror fans. I mean, that's just common now. It's that big horror fans love Halloween and they love the fall and things like that. And they try to incorporate that here. And uh, he always tries to go against the grain. And Deadwood Park is just just an amazing movie. It was memorizing, and I loved every second of it, and I thought it was his best-made film, and I think that it deserves critical praise from everyone. I mean, not everyone, but I mean everyone who likes this kind of stuff would really enjoy it. I think it's a great film. I truly do. Uh, and I think that but the small town is the best small town I've seen in a horror movie in a very, very long time. Maybe ever. But uh, they shoot a lot of abandoned amusement park, and there's just so many great locations in there. The leaves piled up on these old roller coasters, and they use everything they have to their fullest extent. And uh, it's just a really great movie, and you know, I kind of like that haunted character. And then finally, his last film, which is, uh, what else do I got to show you? I probably should have some other things in here to show you too, but uh, maybe I skipped them. His last film he did recently, the most recently done, was, done, did, was, uh, let me see, it's 2011, 2010, it is Ratline. And this film is absolutely crazy. This film uh, kind of starts you off on a trail where you're like, oh, this is going to be about this. Uh, and then it's like, oh, it's going to be about this. And then it's like, oh. No, it's not going to be about that. It's going to be about this. And it's pretty weird, pretty wild, pretty different. And uh, Jason Christ actually stars in this one. Uh, Chris, I don't want to say Christ because it's Chris. Uh, and he actually stars in this one. And you would think that he, he plays this like badass character, this villainous character, I guess you'd say. And he does a phenomenal job. And Yes, I understand. I'd like a cigarette before you kill me. What the fuck we got here? Fucking comedian? Thinks he's gonna fucking joke his way out of here? Don't give him a fucking cigarette! Now when you retards, give me a light. What the fuck did you just say? It ain't gonna lie itself, cocksucker. Where does Satan allow you faggots to play with lighters? Who the fuck 
do you think you are, you fucking puke? I... I'm gonna fucking stop your fucking school in! Excuse me. You're about to be sacrificed! Excuse... You show fear! Listen, buddy. You fucking piece of shit! You dead fucking piece of shit! Hey, man, shut up. Fuck you. Hey. You. Hey! I'm sorry. You've been very entertaining, but my fuse has just run out. Emily Hack also stars in this one, and she does a good job as well. Uh, the two leads do a great job here, and uh, actually all three of the leads do a great job in the film, but the film, I don't want to give too much away, but it involves gore, brutality, Nazis, which is automatic. Uh, I always love Nazis in movies. It's like, because Nazis are like the worst you can get, and you know that there's going to be some crazy, spooky, it's like the more evil something is, the more interesting it is to the to people but uh there's head chopping off and it involves it goes back in all uh, nazi experiments and things like that in the modern day and again it's shot very nice and uh really well made movie and the gore in this one's probably the best gore i've seen in any of their films a head's ripped off and just crazy stuff like this not as serious or as maybe i, I don't want to say dark because i mean deadwood park is kind of dark and really sad this one's not as sad this one's more action packed in there and it's more different elements of different films in there but i love that there's this like cult in the beginning and you're thinking these losers this guy's like what are these guys from a, a jim van pepper movie i love jim van pepper's movies by the way but they remind me of, like those punks or something from like uh my sweet uh not my my sweet satan could be but more so uh the manson family the the new punk wave and i'm like what are these guys he's like satanists and stuff like that maybe they could fit into like that kind of category and then you think the movie's gonna be about them and then it's not and you're like that eh, cool i can dig that and what happens is a uh, complete 180. And uh, Jason Christ, I've only seen him, Chris, only seen him in uh, Ice from the Sun, he believed he, he had a big role in. And Deadwood Park, he had a small role, which I actually thought he did really great in. But this one, he knocks it out of the ballpark. Emily Hack plays his badass tattoo chick, which she does always well. And uh, that's pretty much it. And uh, I would recommend this movie as a, obviously a big movie that is full of gore and... Uh, just a very, very wildly entertaining movie. And as you can tell, they've obviously gotten better from the start, from starting from two like shot on video movies that are just, you know, subpar to like these great movies that are highly entertaining, even when they don't have a minimum budget on a budget. These movies are on less budget than, like I said, and these, all these people are so dedicated. You look at the, uh, like Tim Ritter who would like work jobs, work 16 hours and film eight hours, 16 hours, not sleep for days on end and dedication in these people. And, you know, and the hard work they all put in for this. And, uh, you know, it actually it actually is paying off, especially for these movies. It's like they're going up the stairs and they're going up dramatic three, four steps at a time sometimes. And even if I don't like Ratline as much as Deadwood Park, it, it's just as good, as a, uh, especially on a film level. But uh, they also did, uh, I think I have them sitting here. Let me grab them. I almost slipped if I, if I don't know where the hell they are. Oh, well, but I have them sitting here somewhere. Thought they were here. They also do have this thing called the Severed Head Network, which is a bunch of shorts and music videos in there. And the, the main music video that Eric Stanton did was called Faith and Nothing, which is kind of like a broken, haunted relationship. Uh, it, it's an alright, kind of interesting music video. It has DJ Vion in it. But uh, the other ones he did are like, uh, I believe there's one in a, a wedding place and a couple other ones with zon like a dead slugs. And they're just, uh, you know, I'm not big into music videos, don't know much about them. I just think they're okay. I mean, he has this, like, style in there, but um, he was limited in what he could do, obviously, it seemed, with the music video. And, uh, like I said, uh, he's progressed a long way, and he's actually probably one of the best independent filmmakers, if not the best horror, independent horror director right now. And I'll be looking forward to anything he does in the future. And uh, he also, like I said, he's yeah, obviously, well working his way up and getting in there because he uh, second unit director on the movie Stake Land and the remake of We Are What We Are, the Mexican film, which isn't a bad Mexican movie. It's pretty cool about cannibals uh, family. But uh, he's second unit director on that stuff and produced tons of stuff and uh, working his way up. And hopefully uh, he'll be able to sustain himself by just uh, only directing his own movies. And that would be very awesome because I'd like to see more of his work. And from the Wicked Pixel group, but uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, I try to incorporate some clips. I, I don't. I don't get like revenue from this stuff when I incorporate clips or anything like that. So hopefully it won't get taken down, or the companies can just take the revenue if I get any, which won't be any anyway. So yeah, I'm just letting you guys know. Uh, don't flag me. I'm just trying to help. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good one.